Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming here um, uh, in this very beautiful day. Uh, we want to welcome you to the eighth um, presentation in a new lecture series of the Liberthor Rogo Center for Chinese Studies for winter term 2016. Today's event is co-sponsored by the University of Library and LRCCS. I'm Liang Yufu, the Librarian for Chinese Studies. So we begin first with a few uh, announcements. So tomorrow at 12 noon, the CRIS, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies will present urban, uh, uh, the, uh, urban Hunters in Post-Socialist Ulaanbaatar, a talk by Morton Axel Pedersen. The talk will take place in the same room here. The next and final presentation in the Winter 16 uh, LRCCS new lecture series will take place next week on Tuesday, April 12th, and will be given by Andrea Bachner, Associate Professor of uh, Comparative uh, Literature at Cornell University, who will be speaking on vi violent media beyond the stereotype of Chinese cruelty. On Saturday, April 9th, the final presentation in the LRCCS Chinese Film Series for Winter 2016 will be Blue Sky Bones, a film by the Chinese rock star Cui Jian. The film will be shown at 7 p.m. in Auditorium A of Angel Hall. On Wednesday, April 13th, the LRCCS Tang Jun Yi Lecture Series will pre uh, present Sonia Ospe, a uh, postdoctoral fellow of the UM Center for Chinese Studies, who will be speaking on uh, overcoming communicative uh, di discontinuity and uh, teaching a skill in the Zhuangzi. The talk will take place at 4 p.m. in the room uh, 20, uh, 2022 of the bu uh, Building of Thayer. A reception will follow in the lobby of a Thayer. So this is the end of the, uh, the announcements. Now we would appreciate it if you could take a moment to turn off your cell phones before the talk uh, starts. So today's uh, talk will be given by Professor Hilda DeVert. So she's a professor of Chinese uh, history at the Leiden Institute for Area Studies. Prior to this, she taught at the King's uh, Co uh, College, uh, Oxford uh, University, and the University of Tennessee at uh, Knoxville. Uh, her first book on an uh, intellectual history of the civil service uh, on exams was uh, published by the Harvard University Press in 2007. Her interest in intellectual and uh, political history, information technologies, uh, social networks, and the digital research methods have also led her uh, uh, have also led to her involvement in several comparative and uh, digital humanities works, including Communication and Empire, Chinese Empire in Comparative uh, Perspective, and uh, Did Acta, uh, Automating Chinese uh, Text uh, Extraction. Her most uh, recent book, there's a cover here, her most uh, recent book, Information, Territory, and uh, Networks, The Crisis and the Maintenance of uh, Empire in Song China, published also by the Harvard U uh, University Press last year, takes a fresh look at the question of how the ideal of the unified territorial state took hold in Chinese uh, uh, society. So my first encounter with the Professor Divert was um, some eight years ago in 2008 in a conference at uh, uh, Oxford. So she uh, discussed how she used a digital tool to interpret the song maps. As a grad student in the audience, I was uh, immediately amazed by her research and then became a very big fan of her scholarship. So we are so glad to have her here today. Some of you have already attended her wonderful talk and uh, another workshop yesterday at the library about her experiences in digital scholarship and the Marcus tool she and her team have uh, developed. So today we will listen to more specifically her research on digital perspectives on po political history in medieval China. So now, please join me in welcoming Professor Divert. Uh, 
thank you very much, uh, Leon Yu, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. It's also great to see so many uh, of you uh, turn out around lunchtime for uh, an event such as this. Um, it's, it's been great to be here, not for one, not for two, but for, for three talks. I, uh, I hope that, <laughs> that it, they all uh, present some new and interesting uh, information. I also look forward to hearing back. Uh, my sense is that there's people from many different disciplines, and I think this is, this is a great opportunity for me to also hear uh, how this comes across to uh, people who don't work uh, on pre-20th century Chinese political uh, history. Um, I chose a fairly broad um, topic when I was asked to come up with, with a title and, and an abstract uh, because I'm sort of in between projects and I certainly want to talk uh, mainly about uh, the book project that uh, I've just finished uh, but I also wanted to sort of give you a bit of a sense of, of what I'm working on right now um, and in part this is an extension of, of, of this project. I started working uh, with uh, digital tools to map uh, communication networks and then realized that this also uh, gives us the opportunity to look at some bigger questions, to look at collectivities uh, and their histories uh, in ways that I think uh, were uh, until quite recently fairly difficult uh, to do. I should apologize as in between uh, travel from Amsterdam to Seattle and then now uh, here in Michigan where it's, it's been uh, rather cold, I, I picked up a, a bug so I will be drinking quite a bit uh, as, as I speak so apologies for that uh, ahead of time. Um, in some ways, what, what you see in front of you on the book cover uh, gives you a good indication of what this project uh, is about. Uh, what you see here on the left-hand side, uh, the, the textual part, is a, a page from a commercial edition of what we might call an archival compilation, Shengzheng. Uh, it was a se selection of materials of the Kaozong and Xiaozong reign, so uh, 12th century material, that was published fairly quickly after those reigns had come to an end. It was published for a, an audience of cultured elites, uh, literati, who weren't necessarily part of, of the bureaucracy itself. They might have had aspirations in that uh, direction. But it is an example of the kinds of sources that I will be talking about. Court gazettes, maps, archival compilations were increasingly uh, becoming available to an audience that up until this point uh, had, um, not, ha had not had access to this because these were mostly sources that were intended for a, car a court audience uh, and, and high officialdom. The uh, heading at the top gives you an indication also of the commercial practices that went along with this. This uh, source was uh, indexed in a variety of ways uh, for easy access. What you see there, it says, do not forget the restoration, Huifu. The restoration in this case, or the recovery perhaps is a better translation, uh, refers to the recovery of the northern territories, uh, which had been taken over by the Jurchens uh, in, uh, from well, uh, 1127 onwards. Uh, that remained a, a topic of concern to uh, cultural uh, elites after uh, 1127. The map that you see right next to it connects to this. It's, an ex it's another example of the kinds of sources that were com commercially uh, uh, printed uh, in this case. This is an atlas from probably the 1130s. I think the work of Tao Wu on this, uh, I think, uh, convincingly shows that th this print edition, at least, dates from that period. The compilation may go back uh, slightly earlier. Uh, but what's interesting about uh, these maps, and there were many examples of this, not only in print, but also uh, on steely, uh, and, and also in manuscript form, is that they will never show uh, the Chinese territories as they looked like in reality at the time. That is, divided up between the Qin in the north and the Song in the south. Instead, they portray uh, pretty consistently a, a unified territorial state. The exact boundaries of that may vary. Uh, but uh, it, it gives an indication that uh, what the aspirations of uh, those reading this material might be. Um, I'll be talking mostly uh, about this, and I want to start out with uh, sort of the transmission uh, history of uh, one, I might say, a, a question that is perhaps a question that is still with us today. And to me, this, this transmission history of, uh, or I should say the reception history of this line from the noted historian uh, Sima Kuang is a good indication of what I'm trying to do in this book. What I essentially try to do is to trace a structural transformation in the ways in which uh, information about the polity or about the state um, was, was circulating between the 11th and 12th century. Roughly speaking, from a court-dominated production and consumption of 
court-related materials and state-related materials, such as maps, court gazettes, archival compilations, we're moving in the 12th century into a period where cultured elites, uh, they do not become the main producers, they become co-producers, but they become the predominant uh, readers of such materials. And so, um, when we go back to this line, so we're going back slightly now to the 11th century and, and the Northern Song situation, Sima Kuang uh, submitted a memorial in which he, he raised this question. This is what we're talking, one, uh, 11, uh, sorry, 1061. Uh, he says, uh, in these 1700 or so years, uh, this is from the move of the Eastern Zhou capital in the 8th century BCE until the foundation of the Song, there have only been 500 or so, uh, 500 years or so, in which the realm was united. And I think here he raises a question, I think it's still an important question for all of those, for all of us in, in pre 20th century history to deal with. Now, how come that up until, I would say, the uh, reunification under the UN, moments of uh, multi state rule dominated in Chinese history? That's perhaps not the picture that we get when we read survey histories, but it certainly is, is the case. Uh, that changes. It, it changes from uh, the uh, imposition of. Uh, the uh, U, U of UN rule onwards. There are a variety of reasons for this, certainly institutional reasons having to do with how the uh, Mongols set up their empire and how the early Ming continued uh, those institutions. But I think what uh, uh, we also might say is that something's changing in the political culture of the literati themselves and that that too contributes to their impetus to collaborate with uh, regimes that manage to uh, set up uh, unified territorial states. Um, let's go back to this line. So when um, Sima Kuang was uh, as the noted uh, historian who also aimed to write a comprehensive history quite significantly, he was perhaps after Sima Tian the first historian who really tried to write a history that was not a dynastic history but that was a comprehensive history. He wanted uh, the emperor uh, to whom this, this work was uh, mainly or, or oriented and dedicated uh, to learn uh, political lessons by looking at the long durée of Chinese history, not by looking at anecdotal information, which was another model of thinking about history for political uses at the time. Uh, encyclopedic materials tended to introduce uh, cases, case studies from which broader uh, generalizations could be made. But that was not the model Sima Kuang uh, wanted. He wanted to draw lessons that were based on long durée sorts of questions. But when he submitted this material, there was a sort of, how would I put it, an, an upbeat ending to uh, the memorial from which this line uh, was taken. He wanted to encourage uh, Emperor Renzong to uh, keep this in mind, but he also noted you know, for 80 years now we have been unified. It's just a matter of uh, making sure that uh, we don't lose uh, track uh, of, or lose, don't, don't lose control over uh, the uh, unified territories. Um, when we get to uh, the 12th century, um, this line gets repeated time and again in different kinds of materials. Uh, but the import of uh, the line that I just quoted, and this is uh, the, the bigger question here, uh, changes quite significantly. The first example I have here of the transmission of this line is uh, a stele. Uh, a stele that traces the genealogy of Chinese rulers, about 197 of them, starting all the way in uh, the uh, mythical past, going up to, in this case, the reign of Lizong. But it was based actually on a similar genealogy of Chinese rule that uh, a tutor to Emperor Ningzong, a man called Huang Shang, had compiled in uh, the 1190s. At that point, it only went up to Ningzong, but it was extended later on. Now, when you first look at something like this, or any kind of genealogy of a family or, or dynasties or intellectuals, uh, this was a strategy that was used in, in a variety of ways at the time, uh, the message you want to convey typically is uh, continuity uh, and legitimate continuity, a succession of legitimate rulers. There are, in this case, on the side, uh, a couple of more problematic uh, dynasties. There had been periods of division that were more difficult to accommodate within such a scheme, but by and large, this is uh, the message, at least the visual message, that one might expect uh, to get from something like this. But when we go to the uh, text at the bottom, uh, there is a bit of a, a tension between the image that we get on the top, the image of genealogical continuity, 
and uh, the text that is cited at the bottom. It cites this question from Samak Wang, uh, but it leaves out um, the uh, uh, message at the end that uh, the song had done well, that for eight years had been peace, that it was a message of continuing. Of course, the reason is uh, more obvious. Uh, the, um, the problem that Samak Wang had highlighted, the problem of multi-state rule, had again materialized. Uh, and so, uh, in some ways, this uh, steely uh, conveyed, in this case, uh, to a very different kind of audience. It was no longer uh, targeted at uh, one emperor. Actually, the Huang Sheng, who was a tutor, initially intended it to be a message to uh, Ning Zong, but it was transcribed by the family of Huang Sheng, uh, then uh, transferred to uh, a prefect who was serving in the same prefecture as Huang Sheng's family, from where it traveled to the Suzhou Prefectural School, where it was set up. And from there, uh, multiple uh, rubbings were made, and it was also circulating in print. Actually, the only print edition we have now, interestingly, is a Japanese copy. Um, so it's, it very quickly circulated beyond Song uh, territory um, as well. So one example, uh, but we find the line back, this, this question of how come that uh, there's only been 500 years of unified rule in our history comes back in other forms as well. This is an example from a well-known encyclopedia towards the end of uh, the so of, of Song rule, uh, Wang Yinling's Yu Hai, where in his overview of the administrative history of uh, previous dynasties, he ends with this line, just this line. So how come that uh, you know, we've only had 500 years of unified rule. I'm sorry that this, I still haven't updated it. I sort of highlighted it so much that it's, it's barely uh, readable uh, at this point. So what I, I take this, as, this, this case as an example of um, a change in the uh, audience for which these sorts of materials, and these sorts of problems uh, were relevant from mainly an uh, a chord uh, performance, uh, where Samak Wang wrote a an, an, uh, memorial that was addressed to Emperor Renzong, make sure that you uh, defend yourself against the Xia, against the Tong goods. Uh, this became a um, mobilizing kind of force for uh, cultural elites who became interested in questions of uh, the state. Now, um, the larger um, purpose here is, is to link this to a a, a social uh, histor historical paradigm that I think many of you will by now be familiar with. It's something that came out of the 80s and 90s, but I think that by now has been written in the larger historiography. Uh, that is the idea that um, from the 12th century onwards, um, the uh, literati families, we might say uh, also the, the political elite, was no longer um, uh, centered in the imperial capitals, uh, which was the case, at least uh, for, as far as we now know, until the ninth century. Tackett's work shows that uh, this uh, An Lushan rebellion did not bring about a sudden change in uh, how uh, the Tang Empire was ruled, that uh, metropolitan families continued uh, to dominate the scene, also at the local level, also as uh, local prefects and provincial governors. Um, but the story does change in the course of the Song history. That uh, initially, the, the Northern Song still uh, was court focused and capital uh, focused. But in the course of the 12th, 13th century, um, local or, or elites, uh, uh, um, cultured elites, we might say, um, settled down locally. They no longer um, focused on, on the capital as uh, the place where to network, where to. Uh, uh, negotiate marriages uh, and so on. Um, we might say, uh, and this is, uh, I'm trying to sort of trace the, uh, the political uh, history that comes alongside this, that um, the, uh, when we look at the history of political communication, sort of, uh, almost the opposite, or at least a, a countervailing trend prevails. And that is to say that uh, those who settled down locally uh, managed to uh, or uh, preserve access to uh, information networks that were far broader than their uh, marriage networks, that they were not local, that were at the very least, um, I might say, supra-regional. If they're not empire-wide, they're at the very least um, supra-regional. I'm trying to um, 
trace does development, this development and change in uh, political communication, also the relationship between court and uh, literati in, uh, well, it might say, f at three, uh, three levels. Uh, first level is that of a straightforward institutional history. Um, if you go back again to uh, the 10th, late 10th, 11th century, uh, we might say that the, the Northern Song State uh, set in place a, a set of centralization policies that in many ways actually uh, went further than those implemented under their Han and Han predecessors. Uh, they adopted many of those uh, administrative strategies, but they went further in the sense that, for example, access to um, information was also uh, sharply or, or uh, very strictly concentrated in the capital. A very good example of that is, uh, besides the examination system, I think that's probably a, a story that's familiar to many of you, the construction of a three-tiered exam system that uh, culminated in the palace examination where the emperor himself, at least in theory, uh, would be supervising uh, the exams. Uh, but we might also look for that um, uh, at the archival institutions uh, and the way in which news uh, was uh, brought up uh, but also disseminated down. Uh, an example of that is the memorial's office, the Qin Zhou Yuan. Uh, in late Tang times, these had been set up. The earliest court gazette, by the way, go back to this time period, are Tang examples. But at that point, uh, these had been compiled by what we might probably translate as capital liaison offices. These were offices that regional governors set up in the capital uh, in order to collect information about what was going on at the court. This, it was a fairly um, device, device, or divided uh, political situation at the court. It was difficult to get access to information. So several regional governors set up such capital liaison offices. When we get to the Zhou and then later the Song, uh, we're no longer talking about offices. We're talking about one office. It's the same term, Qin Zhou Yuan. But by now, I think it's probably uh, more accurately translated as the memorial's office. Uh, the idea is to make sure that all information that's coming up from uh, the localities arrives in one place, um, and that also that information that is supposed to be sent down, edicts, uh, bundled edicts, that, that's typically what the court is that most likely looked like. We don't have real examples, but from descriptions, uh, that is, I think, how we can uh, imagine them. Those were also sent down through one uh, office at that point. So certainly a centralization effort at the institutional level, um, but we see that as we move on, get into the late 11th century and then the 12th centuries, um, these uh, centralization efforts look uh, on paper, uh, impressive, and, and they're accompanied with all sorts of um, prohibitions and so on. Uh, but those prohibitions at the same time reveal that they're quite porous. Uh, that, for example, in, in the memorial's offices, there are spies infiltrating who uh, get this information out and into the uh, prefectures before the court gazette has arrived via the, uh, the bureaucratic postal uh, networks. Um, there's even a case where um, the, uh, we, we have information about just how much uh, the bribes were for memorials office personnel that was willing to sell information to some of these uh, spies and, and infiltrators. Um, that uh, is so the example I wanted to use for uh, the history of centralization that by the 12th century then moves into, uh, I would say, a, a situation where elite networks um, uh, informal networks, one might say, begin to infiltrate into those institutions to, to allow access uh, to uh, court information uh, to those who were technically not uh, supposed to have access to them. Secondly, uh, we could see a, a similar trend uh, at, the his at the level of legal uh, history. This is to say that uh, when, when we look at uh, well, you, you could actually just do a comparison between the Tang Code and, and the Song Xing Tong, the Song Code. You'll notice, uh, and definitely when you go, get into the 12th century and you bring in Qing Yuan, Tia Fa as well, the sort of a classified uh, legal regulations uh, handbook, um, you'll notice that the um, prohibitions on materials such as uh, uh, edicts and uh, memorials on border affairs uh, court gazettes, um, archival compilations, 
all the sort of uh, uh, material became increasingly, uh, how would I put it, um, explicitly mentioned as material that should not circulate uh, beyond the court. Moreover, the media in which that material is circulated is also brought up, and, and depending on the medium, the, the punishments were also higher or lower. That if something was circulating in manuscript, uh, that uh, was more leniently punished. If it was circulating in print, uh, that uh, was uh, a more serious uh, infringement. So we see a proliferation of uh, legal prohibitions on all sorts of uh, materials, indicating that those were, of course, also increasingly circulating. But there is a bit of a paradox here, and that actually that paradox was also what uh, motivated me to undertake this, this project, because it was something that perhaps somewhat unconsciously I'd been struggling with for quite a while, uh, also when working on, on the intellectual history of the examinations. That on the one hand, we have the story of an increasing legislation, stricter control uh, over all sorts of materials, specifying the media uh, in which those materials were circulating. But on the other hand, we also see the proliferation of just exactly that, that kind of material not only in terms of, of uh, real materials that we still have access to, but also in terms of secondary discourse on that material. Poems, for example, written on reading court gazettes. Uh, letters that refer to that material. Uh, also poems on, on reading maps and, and a variety of uh, media through which these uh, materials were sort of circulating even, uh, even further. And what we might say, and I think this is the sort of conclusion that I came to also when looking at how uh, the court ultimately acted upon the prohibitions that it came up with, uh, is that there is a, an implicit acknowledgement uh, of um, literary needs uh, of, uh, for access to such uh, information. That to some extent this information was uh, knowing what was happening uh, on the borders in particular, uh, was important for those taking and preparing for examinations. We find throughout the examination manuals, but also in actual questions, questions about, okay, what do we do with the Mongols? Uh, which roads should we take uh, to retake uh, the north? Just very uh, relevant contemporary sorts of uh, uh, questions. Um, we also know that um, as a result of the Jurchens shipping lots of materials uh, up north and more generally the civil war uh, that uh, meant that lots of families with collections had to move and lost collections along the way. I think there's many beautiful examples of, of, and descriptions and Xinjia is a good example uh, of that. Um, we know that the court also tried to replenish its own archives and continue in that way its own, its own history um, by uh, offering rewards to those who were willing to uh, allow copyists to get that archival material back into court collections. So we sort of see a dual um, uh, approach here. On the one hand, yes, this, this, this shouldn't be circulated. And on the other, uh, a recognition that, uh, first of all, it is there. And secondly, that there are also legitimate reasons why such material might, uh, might circulate amongst uh, cultured uh, persons. OK, then at the third level, this is my uh, Third example, and that was also the major part, I should say, of, uh, of, of the book. Uh, I'm interested in tracing this at the level of cultural production. What exactly are the sorts of texts um, that, uh, that were being produced? Who were uh, producing them over time? And also, uh, what can we say about the reception history? That, that last part is always the most difficult part, uh, in part because it's, it's in sources that are far more intractable. You know, that if you want to trace how people read maps, how they responded to court gazettes in letters, in poetry, in known books, um, it becomes a uh, slightly more uh, difficult and, and in some ways always uh, an impossible uh, task. Um, but it struck me that uh, what is very clear, that if you look at all of those uh, genres, uh, of, uh, genres relating to uh, the state, uh, court gazettes, maps, archival uh, compilations, uh, military geographies, uh, that sort of material. Until the late 11th century, uh, the court is more or less the sole producer of that sort of material. Uh, either it's commissioning that work or it is uh, historiographers at the court who produce it and who then submit it and it gets recognized uh, as well. When we get to the 12th century, uh, that story changed entirely for uh, with the exception of, of court gazettes for all of those materials. Actually, not, not with the exception for court gazettes because there is a 
a private alternative to the court because that's those are the short reports, the xiaobao, uh, which uh, uh, one might say sort of uh, journalist types of persons in the capital compiled from hearsay from uh, spies and then also sent out into uh, the provinces. So what we say, what we see then happening is the states uh, or the courts role uh, in this changes from being the major publisher uh, to being an arbiter of that sort of material. Uh, they, they will go uh, or prohibit certain kinds of material. And there's certainly some examples, typically, and I think there might be a connection to be made here with later periods and perhaps even the present. Typically, as in the case of a, a well-known military uh, survey, material was banned when that person was also suspect for other reasons. So not simply because, because the material itself was deemed to be uh, so uh, problematic, but because the person had another message to tell and that, um, in the case of Hua Yue, uh, became problematic. Now, um, I'm looking at sort of this, the second phenomenon, the, the involvement of literati in the production of maps of court gazettes of uh, imperial collections. It struck me that there are two features of this phenomenon that, uh, at least to me, seem quite uh, important. And the first of this is, uh, relates to what is, what is the message of that material? Why are uh, literati um, you know, compiling maps, um, also becoming amateur geographers uh, themselves? Why uh, are they uh, reading uh, Xiaopa, these uh, short uh, reports? Well, to me, uh, and that, that is perhaps the um, countervailing trend to sort of the history of localism uh, that gets uh, emphasized in uh, the social historical uh, literature is that uh, what, what comes out quite clearly there is that there is a mobilization effort related to this. The circulation of maps that showed the entirety of the Chinese territories, uh, military treatises, uh, clearly are or articulate what I would call an imperial mission, a, a mission to uh, mobilize also at the level of, of um, military uh, resources for recovery to the north. To what extent, whether this has to happen right away, whether this is a sort of preparatory exercise, sort of getting resources together to be able to do this in the future, there, there is some, um, there's a spectrum uh, as far as that is concerned. There are far more hawkish characters and then those who uh, take a more long-term uh, view. But by and large, this idea of uh, recovery uh, is, in my view, a shared uh, enterprise. Um, I'll, I'll show some examples of that and then I also want to say something. What, what's also important is the, the geographical distribution of those communication networks because that also gives us a sense that the story of localism uh, is one that perhaps uh, from a social historical view makes a lot of sense but that tends to underestimate uh, the ways in which um, local elites tended to make connections uh, across uh, local and provincial boundaries. Uh, just, this is an example of uh, a historical atlas. It contains a lot of maps, uh, but this, this is sort of the, the main map that you get, uh, that you get when you uh, open uh, this atlas. It shows a trans-historical map. Uh, it, and quite importantly, because if in, in the history, history of uh, historical geography, this typically gets seen as sort of a somewhat naive way of uh, uh, representing space, uh, bringing past and present together in, in uh, a non-distinguishable way. This is not the case. These are uh, layered maps that what is Han, what is Tang, uh, a Tang location is indicated. Uh, uh, here, this, this is an example of how the Song is portrayed at the very end. But again, we see a sort of an administrative picture. This is definitely a coffee table kind of work. It's, it's not meant to, uh, for those who um, want to see exact locations, but it, it does convey this image of a, uh, a unified territory made up of about 23 prefectures. And in the side, it tells that story of administrative uh, subdivision. By contrast, I sort of I have been doing some comparative work with uh, with Blockmans, who is a European historian, and it struck me as, as, as an interesting contrast. If we look at a map that was done at around the same time in in Europe. Uh, that is supposed to be a map of, of Europe, and it's actually one of the most detailed. Most European medieval maps are T-maps, where you, you get uh, uh, Asia, U Euro Europe, and Africa as sort of a tripartite kind of uh, division. They're cosmological uh, maps that are sort of meant to convey a uh, also a, v a vision of um, a, a Christian world. Um, 
Well, this, this map has uh, far more detail about what the Carolingian Empire in this case was supposed to look like. So it's still, you, you get the corner here of, uh, of Europe uh, with Italy and Rome there at the very top. Let me see the cursor. Maybe, yeah, so here you have sort of this main church here uh, is Rome. You got the Alps, uh, then you get uh, the, the Rhine going down and the various parts of what Gallia had, uh, had been. Uh, and uh, I, f I think most Europeans nowadays love the fact that Brit Britain is somewhere here in the water. Um, but it, uh, it gives you, a, 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 I think, an interesting contrast that uh, this is a cosmological vision. We, we are actually not quite sure as to what uh, the, the mission behind the compilation of this map was. It's part of an encyclopedia done in Saint-Omer. Uh, so it could be part of you know, the, a... Uh, monks or a monastery uh, making a case that you know, Carolingian Empire was sort of the, the ideal to shoot for in 1121. Uh, uh, but it could also uh, be read in the context of the Crusades as sort of an, an, an idea to go back and uh, reunify a Christian world. But it definitely is, what, what, what I think by contrast, uh, the administrative kinds of traditions of mapping, uh, which besides the cosmological, it's also there in the Chinese case, but the administrative sorts of tradition, that is something that uh, doesn't come to Europe until quite a bit later. Um, this, as far as sort of the, the um, mission is, is concerned, that I think there is uh, a unifying vision, at least, behind a lot of that um, material produced by uh, literati. Um, but I was also interested in getting a sense as to who is talking to whom about this sort of material. And it struck me um, that uh, for this we have a actually genres that also tend to um, be produced in far larger numbers and printed in far larger numbers than ever before in Chinese history. And again, I don't think that is coincidence. I think there is a structural transformation uh, as far as sort of, uh, we might say, as far as an information regime is concerned uh, in, in Chinese history that, that takes place in the 12th uh, century. Notebooks had been around before, but we have maybe dozens. Uh, when we get to the song, we have hundreds. Um, and they get printed in uh, larger numbers as well, typically in prefaces offers would also justify why they print this material, that it is to establish connections amongst people who are dispersed across a uh, wide-ranging uh, territory. Um, the same goes for letters. We have far more uh, collected writings from also a far uh, greater social range of, uh, of, of literati from this period onwards. Again, I think that has to do with uh, a literati identity that uh, following the, uh, the uh, 1127 crisis comes out far more strongly. It doesn't mean that it only happens then. I think from the late 11th century, there are clearly signs that this is happening, but it only uh, really, uh, that trend consolidates itself, itself as a result of, of the loss of the North and the mobilizing effect of uh, this idea of that we now have to, to bring about uh, change. Um, what I attempted to do with um, the second part is to, is to get a sense of the geographical, the social, uh, the geographical distribution, the social makeup, uh, but also the kinds of uh, texts that were cited uh, in uh, notebooks. And this is where the digital uh, part comes in. Um, we, uh, I work mainly on one person, Wang Mingqing, who uh, did about um, well, one series of four notebooks and then two more uh, notebooks, uh, Hui Zulu, uh, Tou Xialu, and Yu uh, Xin Zhi. Um, in addition, but for contrast, we also picked one from a century earlier and one from a century uh, later. We went through uh, sort of an, an exercise of uh, looking at a couple hundred to pick one that, or, or pick examples that would allow us to get a sense as to who is that person citing, either as an author or as somebody they had a conversation with and about what sorts of, uh, of topics. And then in order to do this in a systematic way, uh, we annotated for each entry, okay, who, who were they talking to? What offer uh, are they citing here? Um, and what came out of, out of this, I, I, I think, is uh, something that, uh, well, we, we can now also allow you access to. So we've, we've put this in, and I think this is perhaps something uh, that we, we should do more of, that is to provide the archive for which we work also in ways that uh, readers can, uh, can trace the arguments and perhaps also uh, come up with, with different conclusions. I think this is certainly possible uh, in this uh, example. What you see here is uh, all, uh, all notebooks in full text. Uh, and at the bottom you get a, a, a 
variety of different ways of, of looking at the material that we uh, marked up. So in the table view, we marked up all the offers, all the persons they had conversations with, also collectors, art collectors, book collectors, uh, patrons, people who, people who commissioned um, work uh, to others. Um, and you can do a couple of things. You can look at, for example, the geographical distribution. We linked these people to uh, their native places in China Biographical Database. And we can see uh, in this case, this is the case of Wang Mingqing. I did a, a, a selection here, as you can tell, for only those notebooks. Um, that This person, who, by the way, never held a court position, so we are looking at someone who's, uh, and also actually never had uh, important positions at the local level, only sort of some secretarial types of uh, positions, and then for short durations. But what we see quite clearly in his uh, example is that uh, he talked to a broad range of people. It's certainly not, in the case of the Song and Empire wide, uh, but it's certainly a super regional uh, information and communication uh, network. Um, you can, if you wanted to explore that material, navigate in a variety of ways. You can go look at uh, these places, then go back. Uh, get uh, the persons who were located in that place, further limited by time. And the, the limitation by time did bring up some interesting conclusions as well. That when we look at notebooks, uh, traditionally there's ha those oftentimes been accused of sort of just replicating, duplicating the material of earlier notebook writers. Well, at least in the examples that we looked at, uh, it turns out that those, those tend to be highly contemporary. Uh, even when it comes to offers. Of course, people you talk to are contemporaries, but offers also tended to be predominantly people who lived at the same time as the offer. Um, and we can also, this is, um, you, you can export material and put it in a historical GIS as well, where you can sort of see more clearly the uh, super regional nature of, of that network. Um, but, uh, and th this I think is, is one of the, the things that uh, is nice about being able to link more, how would I put it, prosopographical and geographical kinds of databases to the full text themselves. So you can look at, okay, who was, who was cited here uh, across these notebooks? And we find that uh, there is no canonization effect, for example. One might expect that, okay, new confusions are coming up. Uh, they might turn to certain people more than others, or they might turn to other cultural icons like Su Shiro, Yang Xiu. There's some of that. Uh, Su Shiro, Yang Xiu are high, but uh, when we Compare that to the, the wide range, over 300 or, or 350 in the case of, of Wang Mingqing, uh, literati tended to um, represent themselves as having fairly broad networks and as a drawing from a wide range uh, of people, at least uh, a, a good number of them. I think the story might be different when we turn to so the more ideologically oriented uh, neo-Confucians. And we also see that this is actually very much uh, an ego document, that uh, notebook writers like to cite themselves. The, the top people are uh, themselves and their dads, <laughs> that, that uh, sort of family document uh, as well. And these are the sorts of things I would say, um, I read through these things a couple of times before I started marking them up, and the things we tend to ignore. It's only by sort of systematically coding that material and bringing it into view in, in such ways that I think we get a good sense as to uh, what the overall uh, structure of uh, that material really looks like. Um, you can from those, uh, this will be on, online, there will be a connection from the uh, side. Uh, when you click on the names of these people, you can go back to the passages where these people were cited. So you can navigate here, you get your results on the left, and you can look at full text. And uh, when you uh, link through to the text, oops, going through all, everything that's highlighted here is also biographical, or th they're people whose biographical information you can also further uh, access. Yes? Uh, can you explain the use of the color highlighting in the following slide? Uh, this one? Yes. yes, I'm gonna get to that now. Okay, this is a slightly different example. I've, I've, I think I should go through this relatively quickly. I realize I've spoken for uh, a long time already. What I wanted to do in the next, because I, I had picked a slightly bigger topic than simply uh, the book, is to show how this sort of approach of, of uh, marking up material and looking at text in this way inspired me also to go beyond that. And not only to, as, as in the previous example, uh, by marking it up entry by entry, picturing an entire communication network, but also the opposite. Uh, we have lots of letters. We have for the song 20 to 25,000 letters, for example. How do you pick the ones that are of interest? Uh, at the time, and this was my library talk mainly, most library uh, databases, digital databases, are fairly useless when it comes to this. 
uh, you can do a keyword and you get all sorts of results that is not very easily uh, explorable. Uh, what we do uh, with this, this is, is the Marcus platform, is we mark up, you, you can choose what you want to mark up, but you can mark up places, people, uh, their alternate names, uh, temporal references, and this allows you to map your material in different ways. You can start focusing, okay, I want to have letters uh, that were sent from this place to that place, or that were sent by um, this type of person, like a counselor to uh, uh, somebody in, in the provinces. So it allows you to, to look at your material in rather different ways. So the colors here to answer your question, these are alternate names, the red ones, you can, you can see it at the top as well, are full names, their place names, their official titles. So here I did a, a fuller markup, and I also did some of my own. You can sort of say, I'm interested in what books they're, uh, they're quoting from, and you can, I can add a category like that. You can make up any other categories that you're interested in, and uh, add those, and they can become a f either a way to read your text, a filtering mechanism, I and mean, you can combine these categories. You could say, I want to see, you know, one day talked about certain books at a certain time, or I want to see, you know, what places they talked about in, in uh, the context of, of war in my, in my particular uh, case. The pink one allows us to access all sorts of other information you've added, because sometimes, you know, you have information about a text that's not in the text itself. So in order to map that information, we allow you to add comments to the text that you can then also uh, bring into a visualization platform to create maps that not only map what you get from external databases, but also what you have as your own material. This is an example of this. I got interested in the letters of Yang Wanli. Yang Wanli is an, inter an interesting character, known as a poet who writes about daily life, known as a sort of interested in, in Dasha and Neo-Confucianism, but not, not entirely committed. Um, so I decided that he has about 500 pri letters that we could call private in the sense that they were not mainly written uh, in, uh, when he was uh, in office and not part of the bureaucratic genres of letter writing. Um, and here I sort of, I, I mapped for half of them, this project is not at an end yet, uh, from where he was writing to where. And you can clearly see when he's, he's at home in Tishui there, uh, he's writing heavily to those at court in showing a continuing involvement uh, in, uh, in politics even when he's away. The idea here was almost the opposite. It was sort of through that range of materials, some of which is highly uh, formal in nature, also allow me to sort of get back to the material I'm interested in, either by time or by topic. Uh, some of it is actually far less formal than, than one uh, might uh, suspect. Uh, from, from the uh, secondary literature. But so this is sort of to give you a sense, if you, if you go through this effort of marking things up, it does allow you to access your materials also for other sorts of reasons later on in a rather flexible sort of way. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, within the platform, the visualization platform you use, you can move from maps to graphs, so you could see, okay, what sorts of people is he talking about either by name or by position at a given moment. Uh, in time. So it's a, a way to explore your information. Very quickly, I know I'm, I'm running out of time, uh, uh, and this is moving into entirely new work that is not finished yet. Uh, but this idea of being able to um, work with um, large uh, corpora of, of, of text made me think that actually the, the history of factionalism in the 12th century has a long history. <laughs> um, but it tends to um, would I, I put it, revolve around uh, the same sorts of issues in the sense that uh, there's some well-known cases, some well-known people involved in this, and, uh, and that's where we're stuck. Because how do you write the history of parties, of collectivities, people, in the case of the Yuan Yu faction, early 12th century, 309 people. In the case of Qin Kui, it's, it's, it's slightly less, it's about 30. In the case of the end of the last sort of prescription, so we're talking about sort of parties as, as contemporary word, but we're talking about people who were put on a list as, you know, these need to be demoted or need to be uh, uh, kept under control. Uh, the Qin Yuan faction, which sort of predominantly is seen as a move against uh, Daoxia people, had about 59 uh, in them. And so traditionally we sort of focused on, on some key people we know already. Uh, and my interest uh, uh, evolved into trying to figure out, okay, what, what is the structure of these lists? Are there groups that sort of were perceived perhaps by their contemporaries as sharing something in common. Uh, and that could be a variety of things. I think we, we don't really know. It could be that they're from the same place, or that they have family connections, or perhaps that they share a common vision uh, on, uh, on certain problems, uh, perhaps uh, recovery of the North, for example. So what we did is we ran uh, 
the, um, the names of these uh, uh, proscribed people, in the case of UNO 309, um, their actual names, their alternate names, through uh, large corpora of texts. So we looked at, uh, we, we picked the an, uh, index year, which is the China Biographical Database, which I've been referring to, gives every person an index year. That is sort of meant to be the time when they're at the tops of, the, of, the, of their careers. They're either dead at 60 or they're sort of meant to be at the top of their career. And we sort of, I decided, okay, let's, let's pick all offers who have an index year between 30 years before and 30 years after. And that would allow, we, we pick all these texts from Sven Song Wen, which now exists in a digital uh, version. And we, we sort of tried to see, okay, did contemporaries perceive connections amongst these people? These connections we can access by looking, do their names co-occur in these texts? So every time I and you, for example, occur in the same text, there's a connection between us. So this, first we did this as, as sort of just a raw run, so to see whether something comes out, and it's, it's an experiment. Here you see you and Yo, we, we ran, uh, we had about 57 documents that yielded uh, results, and so from this picture, what you can see, okay, we, we see a couple of clusters emerge. This is all you need to sort of do at this point. For us as domain, uh, specific, we, people with domain-specific knowledge, we, we're not only interested in the structure. We want to see, okay, what are the names associated with these? And some of these we're going to recognize readily. So Mark Wang had a group, so Shi had a group, and so forth. But some of them make less sense. By contrast, and I think comparison always yields good results, I looked at the uh, Qing Yuan list, end of the 12th century, with, with the Dashi folks, and you see a far denser network. So sort of the main message you want to get from this, most of these the, the people who are in there also have connections to most of the uh, others. Um, this was interesting to me as well. We look at Qingwei, when you do network analysis uh, of, of this nature, uh, the assumption is that, well, you're going to find what you already expect. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You can also do a network analysis that shows the opposite, that shows the absence of network uh, effects. When we look at who Qingwei went, went after, well, most of uh, the texts that, that still remain, um, and we, the cache is, is, is comparable, uh, there is no connection amongst these people according to the text that we have. So that might suggest um, that, in this case, uh, we had a counselor who was going after random people who didn't necessarily share uh, an agenda uh, at all. So these first results suggested to us, okay, this is something that might be worth um, continuing. And so uh, we cleaned up the data because that's always the case. When you use markets, do not expect that it's all going to be perfect. It won't be. It's meant to help you to do this sort of work, but there's certainly, because of the nature of classical Chinese, going to be things you need to work on. So uh, very quickly here, what this has, has shown, we go back, we do the Yuan Yo, we find some groups that we can easily identify, and we find one large group that, that we cannot explain, actually. That's most likely a group of politicians whose roles uh, we have little understood. And I think that can be the value of um, sort of uh, yeah, experimenting with, uh, with digital methods, that it highlights things that we have tended to ignore, in part uh, because of historiographical traditions, in part because of the way our reading and our brains work, is that we tend to focus on things that, uh, that are of interest, and we tend to ignore a lot of uh, background uh, information that's there when we examine it in a more systematic uh, fashion. Um, one of the things that came out of this comparison as well, I'm going to run through these fairly quickly, is when we look at the Qing Yuan group, it mostly consists of a, of a group of a very tight identity. Uh, or when, when we take away their connections to outside groups, they remain as a predominantly a, an interconnected group. It doesn't happen with the Yuan Yo. Um, and just in case, I, I, I was wondering, okay, Maybe we're seeing here something that we simply would like to see. Uh, we, the Tashiwe group is known as a group that, that uh, had a clear identity. Occasionally I get response, well, don't we expect that literati would always be connected? They, they take exams, they have to be with the same people uh, at the capital. So we also decide, okay, let's, let's try, uh, so let's experiment, do some historical sampling. Let's take a group of people who shares the same or comparable backgrounds as those who were listed and see whether they too are perceived by their contemporaries as, as sharing uh, these sorts of things in common. And we get a quite different result. Uh, we, we see that uh, there are barely no connections amongst the 109 people whom we found as, as sharing a background as those in uh, the uh, Qing Yuan prescription, suggesting that indeed this, this was a, a, a group or a, an, an 
political affiliation uh, that was of an entirely different nature from those that had uh, existed before. As I said, work in progress. We will be uh, doing more on this, also trying to figure out, okay, amongst the groups that we could not really, uh, or whose connections we couldn't clearly understand, that's, let's uh, try and figure out what it might be, both through more traditional scholarship as well as by looking at uh, their prosopographical uh, characteristics. So I'll, this gives you a bit of a sense of, of uh, where this is, is heading in the future. I think what shares, what, uh, in my view, and perhaps retrospectively, uh, keeps us all uh, connected uh, is perhaps that question that we started out with, the Mark one question. Right, so we've been mostly uh, uh, a multi-state kind of polity, or, or uh, we have had multi-state polities across the Chinese territories for most of our existence, uh, but that changes. Uh, and uh, I think in the case of, of the uh, notebook literature, we find that indeed the uh, super-regional nature of information networks, the imperial mission, I think is something that suggests that literati themselves were involved in the project of uh, um, being uh, operatives in a, a unified uh, polity. Uh, and actually, when you go to the UN and some of the advisors at UT are clearly articulating that we will work with them because they will actually bring us all uh, under unified control again. Um, the case of Yang Wenli, I think, with connections to the court when he's outside, when he's, he's banned even, shows that as well that uh, the, the local turn, the so-called local turn in social history does not uh, imply a turn towards local concerns only. I think that connection to um, the, the, the polity uh, in a large sense uh, remains there for uh, those who have settled down uh, locally. The uh, Qingyuan party, I think, is a very good example of that as well. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and I look forward to uh, getting your questions and suggestions. Sorry, I can't hear you. So, is it, I understood what you said about the map in the beginning, is that it doesn't include a map that includes a northern Chinese territory as part of China. So, I'm curious about, you know, the 16 prefectures that are bartered away during the five dynasties. Did they do the same thing with that? These included Beijing, you know, present day Beijing, and they were a real pain in the neck of the northern Chinese. Indeed. So, uh, yes, there, there, I, I, I do bring those up as well. So they do not show them as belonging to uh, the Liao or, or the Tin later. So uh, that it, it, it was considered to be part of sort of what I would call a trans-historical normative uh, Chinese uh, territory. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I had Bill Callahan who who's... who's writing about similar issues indeed and in, in, yeah, 20th century, yeah, found this quite recognizable as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a claim about territory rather than a representation of, of what is actually being uh, controlled. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Ah, here. Uh, we, we have started, uh, and I say we because actually this a lot of this is, is collaboration. I could not do this uh, entirely by myself, uh, and so with, with Brent He, He Ho Yang, who's helped me uh, develop Marcus and, and also the, the, the platform that I show that accompanies the book, uh, we've done well. We, we did one uh, graduate course together, and I've, I've done one. Uh, I'm doing one now. Um, it's. Well, two things I would say. That initially, um, it's certainly the case at Leiden, I think that's probably the case in many places. Uh, humanities graduate students did not come into these pr programs because this is what they want to do. I, I, I think they, there is a certain fear, uh, a fear that is oftentimes aggravated by the sort of the, the still looming specter of the quantitative history of, of, of the 70s and 80s. I think that, that the, the fact that we're now looking at an entirely different landscape is, is a message I think that hasn't always uh, come across as well. 
uh, what a, the, the first experience was a very good one, that we had um, graduate students who came in thinking we're going to read classical Chinese primary sources, you know, letters, this is great, but then at the same time had to sort of figure out a way to pick the letter they would be interested in by um, exploring a variety of digital methods. Uh, and it turned out that for many of them, uh, they were able within, by the end of the semester, so I think it is, there is a learning curve, by the end of the semester they were applying this for other sorts of questions as well. In, in one case, somebody was then working on uh, UN artist literary networks by uh, using similar methodologies. Um, we are now doing a, a summer school. This was the Tiangqing Kuo Foundation approach. I so said, would you, would you like to do something like that? And we were surprised. I, I, I certainly was. Um, so this is only within the European region. We got 95 applications for 25 spots. So my sense is indeed um, that, that this is changing, that uh, there is an idea that, and this is certainly not a must, but that it can help uh, when you, Essentially, when I started doing this, it was a good note-taking tool. I you know, didn't imagine some of the possibilities are, that come out of this, something you, you realize further down the, lo the road. Uh, but uh, it's, still, it's still quite difficult because there is no formal uh, curriculum uh, for a lot of this, but the interest is certainly there. I have a question about the corpora. Who's generating the corpora, and what kind of insights can you give us for those of us who work on more modern periods? Mm -hmm. Uh, where corpora are, shall we say, more intimately tied to political narratives of immediate contemporary importance. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I work on people who've been long dead and <laughs> don't have those issues. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that that one, I think, is is is, is very difficult. Um, I think, the, on the whole, for uh, the East Asian region, particularly Chinese history, we're we're fairly lucky. We're fairly lucky in the sense that, at least for pre-20th century ch uh, Chinese history uh, and humanities, I would say broadly, there is a lot that is available digitally. Uh, if not in perfect shape, but if, with some editing, you, you can good, put good collections together. If it, Academia Sinica, for example, um, you, uh, I, would, I still recommend the ch Chinese text, Donald Sturgeon, One Man Operation, uh, wonderful project. Uh, a lot of it is OCR'd, so it does mean that uh, there is some curation to be done. Uh, but nevertheless, you can um, you know, get a lot of material uh, straight away. Uh, and it's, it's in a wiki form, so if people edit the material, it, it is also edited for, for others. Um, so it's, it's, uh, that sounds good. There are commercial databases. Um, you, you know, those who were yesterday have, have uh, had a litany of complaints about how those operate, because they do make it very difficult for you to work with that material, even though we all know this is material that's long been out of copyright. Uh, so I, I, I think that, that that requires some, how would I put it, maybe activism on our side as well, as to say, you know, to, to work with publishers and librarians that um, there should be access rights to that material for tax mining, for other sorts of uses, certainly if you subscribe to it. Um, so it's, and I think that may be the answer to your question as well, that uh, if your library signs a contract, you can uh, put into that that um, there should be tax mining rights. And I think oftentimes it is not done, and um, that is unfortunate. I think actually the, 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 le the legal landscape for this is also changing, that uh, within the European region, again, uh, they are uh, trying to make tax mining rights pretty much uh, a, a default, um, so that you, you, you still have to ask in that case, but you would be able to access raw material if you have a contract with providers. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure that this, this answers your question, your question about modern materials immediately, but it may help you think about how to uh, negotiate. Okay, mm -hmm. any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, let's thank Professor Dibbe.